Hello um, and welcome to this special session on promoting diversity in economics. Um, my name is Sarah Smith and I'm going to be chairing this session. Um, I'm co-chair of a campaign called Discover Economics, which is um, part of the RES, which you'll be hearing about later. Um, so the way the session is going to be organised, we're going to hear first from uh, Arun Advani, who's going to present an overview of diversity in economics, focusing on academia in the government economic service. And then we have um, a fantastic panel for you who are going to be talking about things that are currently going on and initiatives and um, movements which are trying to promote diversity in economics. So they'll be bringing their personal experiences of what they've done, what problems they see, and also what um, they're doing to try and promote diversity. Right, so please do uh, submit your questions and um, we'll uh, have those at the end of Arun's uh, uh, presentation, if there's anything technical that you want to raise with Arun. Um, and then we'll also have the panel session, I think, and hold the questions for the panel members until after they've all spoken. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Arun to talk about the situation in economics at the moment. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, so as Sarah said, this is a session on promoting diversity in economics. So I'll kind of focus on the where are we now uh, to set us up for the, for the rest of the panel discussion. And, you know, economists like to think quantitatively about problems. So I think that's that gives a kind of really obvious motivation uh, for why we why it's useful for us all to make sure we're on the same page uh, in terms of understanding, you know, what do the data tell us about where we are now? Uh, so we can then use that uh, as the first step to start thinking about uh, what solutions might be necessary and how we might address them. Um, and just, I wanted to start with an example from a slightly different uh, context, but I think that's quite related. So this is some work I've been doing uh, with Elliot Ash and David Kai uh, at the University of Zurich and Imran Rasool at UCL. And we were thinking there about um, how much economists study race-related issues uh, in our research. Uh, and this uh, chart shows you uh, these kind of black lines showing you what's the share of uh, race-related research in economics, in political science and sociology. We felt like the latter two were quite uh, reasonable disciplines in some sense uh, to compare economics to, uh, but naturally it's not, they're not exact uh, perfect matches for, for what we're like as economists, uh, but they would be uh, interesting as other social sciences. And what you can see as economists about uh, between the year 2000 and the year 2020, looking across the entire uh, number of publications uh, in all journals, uh, it's stored anywhere in JSTOR or a web of science. Uh, for all of these three fields, you can see economists, about 1.6% of our research was somehow race related. Uh, for political science, it was about a bit more than twice that, about 4%. And for sociology, much higher than that, around 12%. So, you know, on this kind of metric, economists look like we're not doing very well uh, in terms of studying uh, race related issues. Now, of course, lots of people will then immediately jump in and say, well, you know, we study different topics, we have other issues we're interested in, uh, you know, there are all kinds of compositional effects, lots of things we might worry about. I think those are all very reasonable things to think about and all things that we're working on. But I wanted to show you this example today because I think the really striking thing for me uh, when we did this was we also did a survey of academic economists to try to understand how well we knew about what we actually study already. And what you'll see is uh, showing you the uh, 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th and 90th percentiles of people's uh, suggestions, we get the kind of the, the, the distribution right. We get the idea that sociologists care about this stuff political scientists a bit less, and economists much less. But we are way out in terms of the ratio between the truth and say the median estimate for economists. You know, we actually aren't too bad at guessing that sociologists spend a lot of time on doing this. And you know, about 60% of economists were above the, the truth of the sociologists, about 40% were below. Uh, something like 80% were above for political science, about 20% below. For economists, more than 90% of us think we study these issues more than we actually do. So I think it's really, really important that we understand where we actually are right now because I think quite often we actually think the situation in economics isn't what it actually is. And if we don't understand where we are, it's pretty hard to think seriously about how urgent it is uh, to try and uh, look at different solutions. So with that example out of the way, uh, I want to focus for, for the rest of this uh, you know, 15, next 15 minutes on how diverse we are. I should say this is work with Sonkat Sen uh, at the University of Essex and Ross Warwick, who's at the IFS. And so we'll be using, uh, for the most part, for most of what I'll be talking about today, I'll show you using data from uh, the Higher Education Statistics Agency uh, over a kind of six year period, uh, giving me access to data on all students and all staff at UK universities. And what we'll observe is sex and ethnicity. And so those will be the two uh, predominant dimensions of um, 
kind of diversity that I'll think about. I want to add a massive caveat here. There are clearly many dimensions to diversity. Uh, we don't currently cover all of them. In some work I'm doing actually with uh, Ross Work and a couple of other people from the IFS, we're looking at a few more dimensions of, of diversity. Uh, but just to say, you know, big health warnings that there are lots of dimensions of diversity. And for today, we'll be focusing mostly on sex and ethnicity. I'll talk a bit about private schools as well. Um, but that's really what the focus will be on in terms of what I'll show you today. Uh, but I think that will tie nicely into uh, what the other panelists will want to talk about. Uh, and what we're interested in, in looking at is who becomes an economist. Uh, so let's start with what's going on. You know, many of us uh, on this who are watching the session uh, will be at university. So let's start with our academic colleagues. So starting off looking at academia as a whole across the UK, so not economics, but all of academia in the UK, uh, these little orange spots are showing you the, the share in the England and Wales population at the last census, obviously the, the latest census results aren't out yet, but the last census, what was the share of uh, the England and Wales population that came from each of these different backgrounds? Uh, white is excluded from here just because the scale would kind of be completely blown out if I, if I had a white bar. Um, so this is just showing you all of the other groups. Uh, and then it shows you uh, stacked bars showing you the share within academia that are from each of these different backgrounds uh, and then splitting that by uh, male and female. And this is for academia as a whole, just to, again, remind people. So what you can see is that uh, Bangladeshis, uh, people with Bang uh, Bangladeshi heritage, Pakistani heritage, uh, and from various uh, different black backgrounds are all underrepresented uh, at universities uh, relative to their share in the population. Uh, Chinese individuals are very overrepresented relative to their share in the population. Uh, and other groups, uh, the, the other remaining groups are uh, sort of slightly above or slightly below. The other thing to, to notice uh, very clearly is that uh, women are underrepresented. You know, if, the, if these, uh, if, if we had equal representation on these dimensions, you should see every bar being exactly at the height of the dot and each bar should be equal parts uh, kind of red and green. So that's academia as a whole. Against that benchmark, uh, which is, uh, you know, already unequal uh, and you can see certain groups that are uh, underrepresented. Uh, how does economics fare? So this graph, the, this straight line at, at just over 2% is showing you if, if all of the different groups in uh, all the different ethnicities that I could show you uh, were equally represented in academia, uh, in economics as they are in the rest of academia, then every bar I'm about to show you should be at this 2% line. So what, what we're not doing is comparing to the England world's population anymore. We'll now compare to academia as a whole and say, Compared to academia, which has its problems, how does it, uh, economics fare? Uh, and compared to academia as a whole, economics, uh, you can see uh, the biggest and I think most striking thing that you can see here is that you know, in almost every ethnicity, women are underrepresented. So you can see that the representation of women uh, you know, is, is really kind of an issue and is a, is a core issue uh, within economics. That with the exception of uh, people with, from Chinese backgrounds, women are underrepresented from all other ethnicities. Um, you can see that actually, uh, if you were looking at overall, uh, like all, all of the different ethnic backgrounds, actually economics doesn't look like it does too bad against uh, the benchmark of academia, although, as I said, academia itself is uh, not very well represented. But one thing that's important to note is that this includes people who are British and people who've come to the UK. And economics is actually very international, uh, certainly compared to other areas of academia in the UK. So if you focus only on individuals from uh, British backgrounds, you see that the representation, the kind of overrepresentation that you saw on that first graph, uh, kind of melts away. Uh, so you know, the on the previous graph, you can see that Bangladeshi individuals, particularly, uh, are uh, look very overrepresented uh, compared to their share in academia as a whole. Um, but that's really mainly uh, Bangladeshi individuals from Bangladesh directly, or from other countries, rather than people with Bangladeshi heritage uh, from the UK. So it's important to think about. You know, if, we, if we're thinking about what happens to students from the UK, thinking about making their way up through uh, economics, potentially becoming academics, uh, their probability of getting through uh, is not super high. The other thing that's really important is if we're thinking about who produces research, who uh, gets represented uh, at the top of the field in various ways, uh, it really matters whether we're thinking, you know, where these individuals are uh, in terms of which kinds of universities they get into. Uh, and so the Russell group of universities is not, you know, the, the be all and end all of life, but is the set of universities where uh, individuals get the most time uh, to focus on research. Uh, they're the most prestigious uh, people who are, say, represented in the RES are typically more likely to be uh, at the top of the RES, typically more likely to be from these universities. Uh, so this is showing you now for individuals from Russell Group universities, 
uh, again, not looking at economics yet, just looking at all academics, what are the shares of uh, all academics that are at Russell Group universities? So you can see that almost 50% of uh, white uh, individuals who are in UK academia are in the Russell Group. Uh, and then the shares are slightly higher for, for mixed and Indian individuals and Chinese individuals. It's lower for uh, Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups, also for people from various black backgrounds. Here, some of these groups have had to be combined just because the shares are so small, I'm not able to show you them broken down when, you know, for, for statistical disclosure reasons, we have to combine them. So this is already showing you that across all of academia, Pakistani and Bangladeshi individuals and black individuals are less likely to be represented uh, at these top, most prestigious universities uh, relative to uh, other groups. When you look at economics specifically, uh, those problems are worse. So you can see that you know, about 40% of uh, all Pakistani and Bangladeshi individuals who are academics are in the Russell Group, but only 30% are among economists. Uh, that, that kind of gap is similar to what you can see uh, among black individuals. And so again, you can see that it's not only that uh, we have to think about what the composition of, of uh, what well, the ethnic composition of economists is, but also where that representation takes place. If individuals uh, from ethnic minority backgrounds or certain ethnic minority backgrounds are really uh, concentrated mostly in universities where they don't get the same levels of prestige, they're less likely to be represented at the top of the field in terms of positions at the RES, less likely to be represented uh, in terms of the top research that's being produced because they don't have the same uh, time availability for them. Uh, to focus on research, then that's really going to be important in terms of what we then later see. So that's what we see among academics. And a natural question is, you know, is this going to change? Academia is clearly the, you know, getting to the top of academia is already a kind of at least 10 year lag pretty much uh, from when people are starting their undergraduates. So, you know, is this going to all uh, change? And are we just uh, seeing things with too much of a lag because at the top of the profession, it's already people who've been around for a while. So when you look at the male-female ratio, the answer is there's really not uh, a lot of hope right now. Uh, when you look at this, is showing you the share of undergraduates who are economists by sex and by ethnicity. So of all uh, undergraduates who are white men, 3% of them go on to be, uh, are studying economics at university. Of all female white undergraduates, less than 1% of them are studying economics. And so that's how you could read all these different sets of bars. And what you can see is in every case, of all undergraduates who are women, they're much more likely, for any ethnicity, they're much less likely to be studying economics than uh, similar undergraduates who are men. Um, so the, the, you can also see the ethnic gaps uh, across different groups. Actually, white individuals are the least likely to be represented uh, in economics overall, but I'll show you in a moment again this kind of Russell group split that will be important. Um, but you can see certainly in terms of uh, sex, there's really not a lot so far that we can say that suggests uh, that we have a very positive situation. Um, so again, the ethnic gaps, as I showed you with academics, uh, the real striking thing is when you start looking at which universities uh, individuals come from or study at. Uh, so here what we've done, because the, the, it's harder in terms of the scales, what I've done is normalize the share of white individuals to one. And so everything is sort of compared to the share of white individuals who end up at, in the Russell group. And so first again, I'm showing you for all subjects in the blue, and you can see that uh, the same groups that were underrepresented before are more likely overall for across all subjects to be underrepresented in the Russell group. So that's Pakistani, people with Pakistani heritage, people with Bangladeshi heritage, and people uh, from various black backgrounds. Um, when you look in economics, again, you see the same uh, patterns as before. So again, among the same groups that are underrepresented in academia overall, uh, underrepresented in the Russell group overall, they're, they're worse represented in the Russell group when they're economists. So if you're thinking about the pipeline of who becomes an academic, that's most likely, I think, to be people who come from, who go to universities where they are kind of studying with people who are working on research, who are explaining how research is super exciting and how they have a path into uh, a PhD program, who have PhD programs potentially locally. Uh, and so the fact that we see this underrepresentation means that we're going to continue to struggle uh, to see the situation improving uh, without some kind of uh, intervention to try and improve the situation. And then finally, the other um, thing that's uh, particularly important in the UK is the importance of private schools. So 7%, so the, I should say the, the red dots are on the right-hand scale, the, the green bars are on the left-hand scale. So just focus on the red dots for a moment. The red dots are telling you the share of whatever group I'm talking about, so private school boys, uh, that go on, uh, that go to, to university, they're studying economics undergraduate. So 7% of all private school boys who are going to university will be studying economics as an undergraduate. By contrast, less than 1% uh, of 
uh, state school girls who, who make it to university will be studying economics. So there's this kind of striking difference, even when you look just within boys, because we already saw that a sex, the sex difference was large. Uh, among state school boys, only 3% of them uh, are studying economics undergraduate compared to 7% uh, among the private school boys. That's basically mirrored by access to A-level economics. So what you can see in the, in the green bars, which are on the left-hand axis, is the share of undergraduates uh, who had access to, uh, you know, who, sorry, who, who chose to study uh, A-level economics. Uh, in some other work, we've shown that access is really the, you know, not studying A-level economics is typically driven in, in large part, the differences in that are driven by the fact that there's lots of groups that don't have access to A-level. So at state schools, less than half of state schools have access to A-level economics. Um, but that's really what's driving a, a big part of this difference is even having uh, access to A-level economics and certainly studying A-level economics. And this is important because, again, a lot of us uh, who are, a lot of people who are watching this are probably uh, at universities. And we all will say at application time, we don't care about A-level economics. It's not important to have an A-level in economics in order to get into the undergraduate. What we see here is that despite the fact that we don't think it's important for us, it, we don't think it's necessary and it won't make you a better economist at undergraduate students who are thinking about uh, getting into economics, for them, A-level is really the gateway. One in five of them who study A-level economics will go on to study uh, economics at undergraduate. Only one in 150 students who didn't study A-level economics will go on to study economics at undergraduate. So it's really, really striking differences and something that we really do need to think about uh, in terms of what we're doing. If we're thinking how we're going to transition students from the undergraduate through to, uh, from A-level through to undergraduate, um, because that's really, going to be crucial for going to kind of fix this pipeline that we have. And then, you know, one other natural question is, you know, but economics is awesome. We're, we're all economists. We all think well, economics is wonderful. We all think it's a really exciting subject. There's cool stuff you can do with it. Why doesn't everyone just go on and study economics? Uh, you know, do we just need to tell them? And will that be enough? Is the only issue information? Uh, and, you know, the Discover Economics campaign, which maybe we'll talk about, is really, uh, for the most part, focusing on the information and getting students into it to undergraduate. When they get there, will that fix all their problems? The answer sadly is no. Uh, in the, the work I cited earlier of ours, uh, we go through some of the other issues that I won't focus on today, like uh, attainment gaps. Uh, but one that I thought was worth picking up on, given that Felicia will also be speaking shortly, uh, is what job prospects look like for them. And particularly in this case, I should say thank you to the Government Economic Service as the only employer who was willing to get back to us with employment data. Unfortunately, their employment data wasn't super positive in terms of the outcomes uh, that individuals from ethnic minority backgrounds have. I should start with a caveat that the only data we could get was grouping individuals into white or ethnic minority. So despite the various issues we know about grouping all ethnic minorities together and the fact I've shown you huge variation across different ethnic minorities, all I can show you here is white versus non-white effectively uh, without a breakdown uh, for ethnic, what, what, what ethnic minority background individuals come from. But here what we're looking at is the probability of success if you apply to the Government Economic Service Fast Stream, which is sort of the, the super program that you would love to get on if you were trying to get into uh, economics in the government. And so we normalize everything to one in terms of applications, and then we're looking at what share of people make it through to the next stage, uh, separating out individuals who are white and individuals who are from an ethnic minority. What you can see is that essentially at every single stage of the application process, individuals who are from ethnic minority backgrounds are less likely to make it through. And that's really important because you might think, well, there's some point at which we'll condition out that effect. We'll sort of, there's potentially there's some difference you might imagine between individuals from who are white and people who are ethnic minority individuals. But once you sort of discover whatever that impact is that you think is there, you know, you might say, well, they, we, I've already shown you they're less likely to go to Russell Group universities on average. That may not be true in terms of applications here. We don't have that information. But in general, we know that ethnic minority individuals are more likely to have uh, been to non Russell Group universities. So maybe that's some of the difference. But actually, at all of the stages as we go along, it still is the case that white individuals are more likely to progress uh, than ethnic minority individuals. So there is something that needs to be thought about carefully about what's going on at all these different stages that leads to these ongoing differences. So what might help things change? The answer is that that's a really complicated question. And so I'm delighted that I'll be handing over to a panel of four people who are much more qualified than me to talk about that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Arun. That was really helpful in setting the scene um, and revealing some of the areas where there are clear underrepresentations of particular groups. Um, I can't see any 
specific questions for you. So we'll move on to the panel. Um, and I'm really, as Irene said, it's really exciting to have here a set of people, all of whom are kind of actively engaged in different initiatives to promote diversity. Um, so they're all going to talk uh, for 10 minutes each about, you know, some of their experiences, perhaps some of the um, underlying causes behind the um, different levels of representation that Arun has identified and also things that they're doing to help address the gap. So the first person um, who's going to speak is Anna um, and I wanted her to speak after hearing her talk at a European Central Bank conference about some initiatives from the European Central Bank where they've really, I think, done, gone quite a long way towards trying to understand uh, the underrepresentation of women at more senior levels and also actively taking steps to um, pr promote women. So Anna, I'll hand over to you first. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as Sarah said, I am going to talk about the uh, measures that the European Central Bank is with the European Central Bank is doing to promote diversity, but I will focus on gender. If all the results and everything I am going to say today comes from this paper that I co-authored with Laura Spido and Lac Levin. And um, let me set the stage telling you a bit about the institutional background, which is the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank is the bank of, um, of the euro area. It's a major central bank with an international workforce of about 3,000 3, employees for the, from the different EU countries and the UK. And it's an expert-based organization. Experts join the European Central Bank at different salary bands, depending on their education and work experience. And um, how career progression goes uh, is as follows. Salary progression takes place between each salary band. And um, the, salary, the salary increase follows um, performance evaluation. Uh, performance is evaluated every year. And then um, according to this performance, um, salary increase is granted, but promotions to higher salary band actually follow a selection campaign. Whenever a um, vacancy is open, uh, potential candidates have to apply, then may or not be shortlisted, may or not be selected for the process um, of interviews and even written exercises sometimes. So this is how it works. I will focus my talk on promotions to higher bands. And um, what I am going to try to answer today is uh, whether they are gender gaps in career progression at the ECB, whether the corporate um, diversity policies that the ECB has been taking have managed to mitigate those gaps, and which are the factors that account for these gender gaps. The data we use are personal data from the records of the ECB, so they are registered data. Uh, we have a lot of individual information, but also information about the selection uh, campaigns, information about the vacancies, who applies, who is shortlisted, whether they are or not selected, and whether they are or not successful. And um, the focus of the talk today is going to be in, in the, I will focus on the, at the expert level, how experts move to more initial level, to a more senior level, in fact, which is called from economist and senior economist to principal economist or advisors. Um, and I will look at areas that mostly employ economists, the areas in the ECB that, for example, legal services that uh, employ lawyers. But uh, my sample is very homogeneous in, in terms of uh, education and uh, work experience of, um, of the individuals. So starting with the promotion gap, the, the chart I am showing to you here um, is just uh, um, calculated from raw data. The dark line is the promotion rate of men minus the promotion rate of women, that's the, the promotion, the gender promotion gap as time goes. This is uh, five years after, after entry, 10 years after entry. And for the data before 2011, uh, 10 years after entry, this gap is 36%, quite, quite large. But after 2011, which is the red line, it vanishes. It drops actually by 80%. This point here is 8%. You may already be wondering what happened in 2011. Just an, as an advance, the um, diversity policies were in place as of 2010. Uh, this, as I say, are raw data. We calculate, uh, we do some regressions and control by individual characteristics uh, of the workers. Uh, um, the change is not that large. The annual probability of promotion of women is about 3% uh, lower than that of men. That means 3% uh, on average uh, gap uh, 
um, a year is about 30 after 10 years, so it's very little that the individual characteristics have uh, can explain from this 36% gap. And um, from 2011, the gap uh, actually becomes insignificant, disappeared. Um, and as I said, the different what happens around 2011 is that the ECB made his public statement on diversity, publicly commit uh, to promote diversity with uh, a statement that come is um, that uh, goes as follows the ECB we believe uh, that diversity creates excellence and elaborates on this and there are several facets of diversity in this uh, public commitment gender nationality ethnic origin etc but uh, this study focuses on gender and uh, several measures were taken in each one of these different facets the ones in gender go through targets, diversity creation or diversity ambassadors, women in leadership training, flexible working hours, teleworking, mentoring, and a long, long, etc. that I will summarize as a change in the corporate culture. So at this point, you can think, okay, the ECB did well, is this policy uh, that had an effect? Uh, well done, but uh, actually, this uh, absence of promotion gap after 2011 is masking two other gaps. One is the negative gender application gap, and the other is the positive promotion gap after application. And um, we are able to study these because we have information on the campaigns, on the campaigns that are open for promotion. For, uh, and we have this information from 2012 to 2017. That is the, the period in which there is not a promotion gap any longer, and this not visible promotion gap. Um, Let's go one by one. The application gap. The application gap. We, we observe that women apply less than men for promotions. And this we observe it in the raw data. We see that they apply later, that they wait to have more qualifications. And when we go and run some um, regressions, here we estimate the probability of applying for promotion with a large number of controls, some of which are listed here. And we see that there is some. In fact, a large um, application gap that goes from 1.4% to 1.8%. This is very large because the average application rate is about 38 uh, So this is 40% of the actual average application rate. And when we look at the different factors behind this, a remarkable one that I want to mention is that this applica application gap in part is explained by gender differences in the response to competitive environments. We, you see here is a negative application gap that is even more negative when the campaign is external, is open to a, a people outside of the ECB, there is external competition. And we have also created some indicators of the perceived competition by the individuals, whether in particular this one that I am showing here is an index of the percentage of direct colleagues at work that um, are very high in the salary band, so they are serious com um, competitors. And in this case, also the, the gap increases. Women are more reticent to, to apply. And obviously, this negative application gap to result in a no gap in the promotion have to be um, coupled with a positive promotion gap after application. And in fact, this is what our data tell us for all in application, the probability of promotion of women at the ECB is larger than the probability of promotion of men. We see here at the controlling, as I said, for many individual characteristics, that women are more likely to, to be promoted once they have applied. So the, your intuition may be saying, well, this may be due to positive discrimination. Managers and the selection committees have all this pressure or reaching um, diversity, gender diversity, or promoting it or hiring women. So this may be indeed um, positive discrimination of the female candidates. But we find that this is not the case. And I am going, I, I hope I convince you with this evidence that is simply that women, when they apply, they are more qualified than men. In fact, uh, if we uh, use as a measure of performance salaries that as I explained at the beginning, increasing the salaries granted after performance evaluations, then uh, looking at which is the performance in terms of wages of women just after, after being promoted, we see that in general, there is a negative wage gap, women earn less, but 
after being promoted, there is a positive wage gap. Women earn more. And if we believe that these wages are a good proxy for, for performance, this is telling simply that women are performing better. Still, skepticals may say, no, this may be part of the same discrimination, positive discrimination process. It's all this pr pressure to favor women at the ECB that even they are granted with higher salary increases. And, this, and uh, so we try to disentangle with it. This is true. And for that, we ran the same regression with the sample before 2011. And after 2011, what was the policies for diversity are in place? And we see that women perform better than the uh, male counterparts. And this was even more the case before 2011, when these policies were not in place. There was no pressure to grant higher salaries or higher um, promotion uh, to women or more promotion to women. So we can conclude that, in fact, conditional or applied women are more likely to be promoted, but this is not due to discriminations, you know, it's due to the fact that they are very better qualified than the male counterparts. So let me summarize all these findings. I had very quickly growth and go through them, uh, but basically are can be summarized in three, four points. Gender promotion gap before 2011, gap that disappears after this uh, public commitment to diversity was in place in 2010. But still, women are less likely to apply for promotions, and this is particularly so when they expect high competition. But once they apply, they are more likely to get promoted uh, than men, and this uh, cannot be seen as discrimination, but as merit. Um, I don't think I need to, to mention this here with this public, but when I presented these papers in, in several forums, the question was, so and why is the ECB caring about this, actually, if they don't apply, it's because they don't want to apply. Even if um, we don't uh, think of moral um, reasons to care about this, even if we only think uh, of the ECB as an employer, I think they should care because otherwise it's just a weight and misuse of human capital, right? But um, let me move on and see what is our takeaway from, from this, uh, for these findings. These findings point to the effectiveness of, of corporate diversity policies. At, at least they worked for the ECB in reducing gender bias in promotion. And um, in terms of uh, contribution to the literature, if I have time, I would say that this lends support to the multiple equilibrium view of the, the representation of women, which is this view. It's a view that um, there is not fundamentals for this difference, but are the expectation that women would not perform equally well as men that are self-sustained. Um, for example, let me give you an example for that. Albanese and Olivetti, 2009, they, they, in, in, in the paper, women are less paid because um, they are expected to spend uh, more effort on home production vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, market production. And since this is the expectation, the optimal choice for women is indeed spending less effort in uh, market production so that this becomes an equilibrium. But this equilibrium may be changed by policy. The policy is kind of the equilibrium selection device. And this is actually what we found at the ECB. Another, this, um, nevertheless, this findings also suggest that supply side explanations are at play. They still remain relevant. For example, women apply less if they expect competitive environment. The takeaways for the ECB as an institution, uh, they are more policy oriented takeaways, which can be that. But it, the main takeaway, again, is that corporate policy and corporate culture mainly make a difference in mitigating this promotion gap. However, more needs to be done, but this, that was our policy advice to, to the ECB Human Resources Department by lowering the barriers for women to seek for promotion opportunities and also in fostering even more the inclusive culture. Uh, with the, the new measures that the ECB has been taking, they has been very responsive to, to the findings in this paper, actually. And there are new measures in place to foster more this inclusive culture, like inclusive training for managers, which is compulsory and is monitored. And um, recently, like a few weeks ago, they launched these uh, gender scorecards uh, this is just for transparency and accountability in the intranet. We all, and it's, it's very easy to use. We very, in a very easy way, we can find all the information on gender uh, 
statistics, gender rates by business area, new entrants, uh, different salary bands, and, and this is at hand for any worker at the ECB. Also, uh, the mentoring program has been uh, uh, fostered. In fact, I must say that in this uh, empirical research, we found that uh, okay, it was the whole package of measures that changed the culture and work, but the one of the measures that were taking work individually was mentoring and many other, other uh, measures in this, in this uh, line. New targets have been set, for example, the target for 2026 for senior management, now it's 40%. And um, an interesting target that has been set is not in terms of stocks, but in terms of flows. The new intakes all over the ECB must be 50%. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's a, a really interesting example of how an institution can really change things if it sort of puts its mind to it. I'm not aware of any other institution sort of it, it, that employs a lot of economists doing that. And Felicia might want to pick up whether, what she thinks about that in the GS context. I just have one, there, there's no questions in the chat as far as I can tell. Um, I have one question for you. So yep. you reduced the gender promotion gap, the ECB reduced the prom gender promotion gap. Was it by um, sort of narrowing the application gap or by narrowing the, the, the probability of um, being successful if they applied? I, I, I take it the two, the, the decomposition was all for afterwards. So I just wondered whether you looked before and afterwards. Yeah, so, we, yeah it's, uh, we cannot uh, look at it. I cannot be, may I, give you evidence because for the campaigns, we only have information starting in 2012. Okay, okay. But there is a result that gives us a hint. If you see, um, in the whole story of women being, promote, being more likely to be promoted after application is a self-selection, women wait to be better prepared. I will say that the application gap is likely to be now, uh, to have narrowed because the, I don't know whether I can go back. Yes, I can. But in any case, uh, you may remember the results. With, when we tried to evaluate whether women perform better after promotion, we found right, that yeah. they did perform better. And that was that even more matter. the case before 2011, which uh, hints th that uh, before 2011, the self-selection out of the applicants' um, pool was even more stronger. They waited more to be better prepared before applying. So right. it's, we believe that the application gap has narrowed. It has narrowed. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we'll move on um, and hear from Felicia, who is uh, who works for the Government Economic Service and is also uh, the founder of the Black Economist Network. And as Arun has shown, uh, there's quite a lot of underrepresentation of um, Black economists. So Felicia, can you tell us what your what, what the kind of the role of the Black Economist Network is and what issues you see facing Black economists in particular? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sarah. So um, for my talk, I'll start off with like why I came to found the Black Economist Network and talk about some of the issues and why this matters, then the network and what more um, some of our members have said that the economics community and different organisations can do. So I'll start off with the founding story. Um, so I guess from early on, I've always been intrigued in the ways in which economic theories can be used to tackle some of the most complex economic issues. Um, but it was to my surprise when I found that, you know, in my undergrad, I didn't learn of any prominent figures in economics that looked like me or had a similar background to me that were from that were either black British or black African. Um, I think we learned of Arthur Lewis who was the one um, black economist we'd come across and the only um, black economist to win the Nobel Prize. So I initially thought that this was a problem in academia um, as we see academia has had an issue as Aaron has shown but as I started working, I quickly realized that this was a widespread issue across all sectors when it comes to economics. So um, in my first role as a, as a government economist, I was the only black female economist in my department alongside another black male economist. We started at the same time at the same grade in the same team. So there was about, I guess, 60 economists in the whole department and there was only two of us at the same grade. So this le led me to question where all the black economists actually were because I know that I had seen them when I was studying in my undergrad, but you know, I don't see them reflected in the reading list. I don't see them out um, represented in leadership positions. So I was a bit confused. And 
when we are talking about much of so I started this network in 2019 and at the time much of the focus on diversity and economics was centered around um, gender representation but often overlooked was the underrepresentation of black professionals in this space and being a woman and being of black um, descent that was like the intersection of the two so I was hardly represented at, at all and this lack of visibility meant there was literally like no initiatives at the high levels to address this I didn't see anything like this and as we know economics is not very racially diverse in terms of what we see out there and a quick google search of some of the top held positions in um, organized economics organizations from think tanks to banks really does show that um, but this is important not from just an equality standpoint but also from the perspective of policy making so as economists we hold some of the most powerful positions in societies with the abilities to form policies and change lives but these policy recommendations are dependent on the evidence and analysis underpinning them and whose perspectives are being included so a lack of attention to issues faced by particular community groups can ultimately lead to poor decision making and policy and negative outcomes for these groups and it's basically for that reason why I started the Black Economist Network. So the Black Economist Network was um, launched in November of 2019 and we're basically an organization dedicated to providing a platform through which professionals and students from the African and Caribbean descent in economics and related fields can connect, collaborate, share ideas and support each other. Um, we also seek to challenge the lack of diversity within economics related fields by bringing together and raising the profile of black people in economics, amplifying their voices and um, working alongside different economics organizations just to improve the lack of diversity. So I'm pleased to say that, you know, since 2019, despite the pandemic, we've managed to grow to over 300 members um, across the world. We have mem members in the States, we have members across Europe, as well as the African continent, Caribbean and Australia. And um, we're made up of about 54% um, students and about 46% um, of um, of professionals, early career to senior. Um, and we've been able to reach um, a network of over 4,000 Twitter followers, um, 1,000 LinkedIn followers, and uh, 800 now, I believe, Instagram followers. So we're growing as a network. And um, our key, we have four key, key aims. So our first aim is actually to connect. So this is to um, essentially bring together different black economists um, to chat, meet up regularly, just a safe space so people can feel like they can air their grievances and also meet people that look like them, um, maybe seek advice. And it can give them that little bit of boost, you know? Um, then our second aim is to educate. So this is all about um, equipping uh, current and aspiring professionals, economics professionals on career options and skills needed for career progression. Because I think this is important, especially, um, you know, coming from an ethnic minority background, um, a lot of what we see is like, oh, you need to go into certain positions, the high profile ones, especially like going into banking. So often the view is that you do economics, you're going into the private sector, you're gonna be an investment banker. However, there's so many different roles um, in the economics area that people should know about and we will try to raise the um, profile of. Then our third aim is to inspire. So we really wanna just encourage debate on topical economic issues, alternative economic perspectives, and promote an environment where members can learn from each other, but also engage our wider audience as well with what we're doing. So this is, um, for example, we put on our Black History Month events. We recently had a women, um, a women in Economics event, not too, about two, three weeks ago, which will be up on our YouTube if you want to watch it at some time. So feel free to connect with our website to find out more. And um, our final aim is to influence. So this is about changing the status quo and working with the economics organizations to challenge the lack of diversity in economics. And um, so we've had a few key milestones. So we launched in 2019, um, we've built our membership. We've also hosted a range of mentorship programs, um, various collaboration events with different organizations. So at the moment, we're working with Frontier Economics on our Black Heritage Program. So with um, Frontier Economics, what we're doing is this a program allows um, students who have applied um, to um, 
gain some insight working with frontier professionals to get some work experience and fully like immerse themselves into what frontier is about and hopefully inspire them to explore other career options in economics and we hope to do this with other organizations too um because it seems it seems to be really positive we're just starting now so we'll see how it goes um and yeah um but we can't just we can't change the economics community alone and there are various ways in which we would like um the economics community to help this situation of diversity so i actually put this question to our members and asked them okay so realistically if we're thinking about what practical steps the economics community can take in order to increase diversity um what what do we think those are so i've, I've managed to summarize them into four key points which i'm going to go through now so one is increased visibility so visibility of black economists in their work is key actively seeking out black economists to speak at events write articles comment on a range of economic issues that aren't just race because black economists aren't just race specialists they're actually interested in other economics fields um and yeah and the field needs to amplify the work of black economists so that we can start seeing ourselves and the contributions that we make secondly increased um, relatability so this is hosting seminars events or even carrying out research that makes economics less foreign and isolating if the goal of economics is to increase diversity and be inclusive then the material that the field produces must also be relatable to the experience um so this is basically about you know exploring other sides um, in economics giving different economic examples that might be more relatable to people's lived experiences as well um the third one is increased support. So this is, um, you know, by donating and providing support. This could be partnering to deliver events. This could be giving workshops and various initiatives like mentorship and training programs, which are targeted. And finally, um, increased opportunities in general. So by supporting potential um, current black economists through the pipeline, such as funding, creating targeted outreach programs to introduce economics as a viable option to um, black students or black professionals who wish to enter the field. Um, and this, this also includes like um, offering paid opportunities as well um, and in paid internships, especially, and just, um, overall aspiring, um, inspiring um, potential black economists to the field. Uh, that's what we said in general, but more specifically, um, we've also been working with the GES and um, other public sector organizations we've been in contact with. And there are certain steps that we wish that they could take, um, especially when it comes to policymaking and the analysis underpinning policymaking. So we've um, put, categorize this into three parts which we've made some progress on but there's still a lot to do so one is tracking progress so the BAME categorization isn't useful in efforts to improve our understanding of diversity and therefore we've called for better um, data collection and disaggregation of data um, this just allows for better data transparency and allows for people um, for us to monitor actual progress. Um, this is particularly um, important because if we don't have a better disaggregation of data, we don't know who's getting the opportunities, who's being exposed to different roles. Um, and then it just makes it harder to prove the point that we need these initiatives to take place. And then moving on from that, we want to go on to targeted initiatives. So there are various issues across the entire pipeline from entry to leadership positions. So we want these organizations to work on specific targeted outreach programs. So that are focused on the beginning of the pipeline, but then also develop talent programs and initiatives to improve um, progression amongst existing economists within the pipeline. Something that I have noticed is that once we're in the pipeline, retention is a bit of an issue. And that's usually an issue because even though um, people at the top of the of the organization or maybe senior economists are like, yeah, we really want diversity. We really want to encourage that. They're not the middle management, however, as many of us are um, in lower grades, we're dealing with middle management and on a day-to-day -day basis who aren't giving the same, I guess, vim or the same energy towards the diversity initiatives as we see happening on the top or we see promoted. So this is really important. Um, so the, the 
development um, of talent programs as well as better uh, transparency of data really helps. But then also going into the data analysis side of things, across some of the public sector organizations, not all, we realize that the treatment of analysis on race, um, such as in the public sector quality duty, is not approached as a core part of the analysis. Um, so the public sector policies duty is basically looking at a certain policy and um, doing an assessment of how this will impact different protected characteristics such as gender, disability, race, etc. And it's it's not a core part of analysis and, and it's often treated as a tick box exercise. So it gets pushed aside or sometimes not even done when it should be done. So we really wanna call for coordinated efforts to look into how policy analysis is conducted to ensure that this is no longer the case. So um, ultimately, that's what we're doing. That's what we're calling for. And that's who we are as the Black Economists. Um, but yeah, thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much, Felicia, and congratulations on everything you've achieved so far. That's really, you know, to have started a couple of years ago and to have got uh, to have come so far since then is really impressive. And hopefully, you'll be working with some of the organisations um, in the RES, I guess, with uh, Steffi, the diversity champion, also with Maeve, who um, is, is uh, our campaign manager for Discover Economics. Um, so someone's put a very specific question in the chat. I don't know whether you will know the answer to this, but it does say, is there an immigration status requirement for entry into the GES? You may not know the answer to that, but if anyone on the panel knows the answer, it'll be you. So I thought I'd just mention that now. So in case I, think, I, think it, I think it depends on the role you're applying for. But I think if you've got, um, if you're a British citizen, um, it might vary for Commonwealth. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So Arun says it's only in the, uh, the, the the foreign office, I think. Is that right? Okay. No, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so it's really interesting what you're saying of sort of about data and tracking. Um, I mean, I think, you know, so the ECB has been very open in its ambitions and very um, transparent in terms of allowing people to analyze and publish the analysis of the data. Um, you know, I, I really hope that the GES will sort of do something similar. So, and as you say, disaggregate it further because, you know, using this broader BAME categorization is not very helpful when there's real differences across across ethnic minority groups. So I think it is really important to push for that data analysis and, um, you know, sort of tr uh, use use the data to kind of reveal where the issues are and, and hopefully the progress that's been made. Yeah, currently the GES is going through um, a diversity audit, so it'll be interesting to see the outcome of that. So hopefully we get better outcomes. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for sharing that. And we might have some more questions later on. Um, we have two questions, which I think I'm going to sort of put to May because they're about um, about um, bringing younger people into uh, into economics. Um, so hopefully these are things that you're going to talk about, May. So how do we get more diverse students coming into undergraduate programs? Um, do we have to get to school kids early? And then how far, a sort of similar question, how far back down the education do we need to go all the way to pre-GCSE or even earlier? Um, the problem seems so circular as we know to attract students, we need diverse staff. So I know that you're going to talk about some of these issues. Um, so what is Discover Economics and what are, what are you doing? What are you doing to help attract more diverse students? Well, yeah, hopefully some of the answers, well, I'm, I'm obviously don't have all the answers to those questions but so we're doing some stuff so hopefully it'll, it'll come out in in my talk in general so yeah so discover economics is a royal economic society campaign to increase diversity in economic students um so i'm just going to talk a bit about what we're doing as a campaign um so the main question we're asking is so everyone's showed the problem um with all the yeah that, that female underprivileged, um, well, actually, he didn't speak about underprivileged, and that's something that, um, and by that I mean low socioeconomic background, um, low-income students also don't um, study study economics, and um, which is obviously revealed a bit in the in the state school um, data. But yeah, that's that's another aspect that doesn't um, perhaps get talked about as much. Um, so why don't more female underprivileged or minority ethnic students study um, economics? So that's the question we're trying to answer. Um, and we spoke, we focus specifically on 15 to 17 year olds. So obviously diversity in economics is an issue throughout. Um, we can't solve it all. So we're specifically looking at students who are choosing their A-level subjects or choosing their degree subjects. 
So I'm just going to spend the next few minutes talking about um, the problems that we face, the barriers that are in the way, uh, what we're doing to overcome them, and then, of course, how, how you guys can help us. So our vision is a world in which economics attracts the brightest and best, irrespective of their background, and in which potential students see, economic, see economists as being people just like them and are excited by the idea of studying econ economics. So that sounds good to me. So we need to think about what is going on to... Um, stop us from achieving our visions and there are a few answers to this and I think probably the most pressing is that people just don't know what economics is so obviously young people but people across the board just don't know what economics is and um, secondly those that have heard of economics often hold many misperceptions about what economists do and then of course there's also a significant lack of women of working class people of minority people from minority ethnic backgrounds um, and this leads to these people feeling alienated by the topic and concluding that it that it isn't for them. So in cap to encapsulate all of this, we talk about economics as having a di identity problem. So there's a physical identity problem uh, with a large overrepresentation of affluent white males. There's a problem with the perception of what economics is. And um, so most people obviously equate it with money and banking and finance, and they don't think of it as being able to talk to climate change or coronavirus or inequality or all these really important social issues that, that people really care about. Um, and there is also a problem with what with the perception of what economists do. So they're too often thought of as people who run the economy rather than people with quantitative and analytical skills that can be applied to, to loads of different questions that matter. Um, a related but separate problem um, is that economics is not often talked about, let alone taught at state schools. So there's a real lack of A-level economics teachers. So there's no economics PGCE, so the, 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 the course that you have to go to to learn to be a teacher, there's no one of them dedicated to economics. Um, and teachers who have studied economics, so people who've been at economics undergrads and go on to teach, um, are often encouraged to teach maths. So maths teachers get a, a golden hello in the UK, so they get some money for being a maths teacher, which obviously incentivizes people with a maths background to go on and teach maths rather than rather than economics. Um, so due to this big shortage in A-level economics teachers, um, a lot of them, a lot of the teachers that there are get sucked into, into private schools. So like Arun was saying, there's a really low, um, the state schools don't tend to be able to offer A-level economics because there's this big lack of economics, A-level economics teachers. And this uh, perpetuates the problem of only affluent students taking it to degree level. So at Discover Economics, we try and address these problems through, through our three campaign goals. So our first one is we work to communicate what economics is and what economists actually do to 15 to 17 year olds from underrepresented groups. Next, we work to amplify the voices of economists and economic students from underrepresented groups in order to provide role models for potential economic students. And then lastly, we're working to increase the availability of A-level economics in state schools where it currently isn't taught. And luckily for you guys, you can get involved in, in, in many ways in all of these different goals. So the first one, so our first goal, communicating what economics is and what economists actually do. And um, we do like a lot of the, the usual things like we have social media platforms and we put on events um, online at the minute, obviously events in person when, when that's allowed again. Um, but the, we, we think that the main, the, the best way to speak to, to communicate with young people is through people who are already communicating with young people. So in order to be able to speak um, with young people, we've been setting up different networks of people in different capacities to help us talk directly to young people. So um, we've got several, we've got several champions networks. We've got professional champions, teacher champions and academic champions. And these are all in their infancy at the minute. We've not... Um, We've not been going at this for long, but this is this is sort of what we're doing at the minute. And I guess the most relevant one for this audience and probably the most important one to meet our campaign aims in general is, is the academic champions. So we've set up a network of academic champions who are economists within economics departments who are working on outreach and widening participation at their universities. So there's loads of amazing things going on up and down the country um, in universities with outreach. But at the minute, universities aren't really talking to each other about the different things that they're doing. So what we're trying to do at um, Discover Economics is, is, is bring these people together so that they can um, share best practice, share advice, um, support each other, and also share resources um, and ideas 
and we can bring these all together in one place and academic champions can come and 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 work together to put on the best outreach programs that they can and the reason why it's so important for people to do this within universities is because universities have incredible widening participation teams so if we're trying to reach hard to reach schools that's what obviously widening participation that's their, their bread and butter so we as economists who recognize this problem in economics need to be utilizing the widening participation teams at our universities um, and making the most of the relationships that have been built up over the years and trying to um, speak directly to these young people from these underrepresented groups in the schools around our universities so as a as a shameless plug um, our next meeting of academic champions is on the 28th of april and um, it'd be amazing if you wanted to come along to that and um, you can get in touch with me loads of different ways so um my profile's on the conference site we've got an exhibition stand in the exhibition center on the conference site you can our website is discovereconomics.co.uk you can get in touch with me through that my email's on the res website so do get in touch and come to our meeting on the 28th of april and the other thing that we're doing, which is a bit of an offshoot of the academic champions, is some of our academic champions have volunteered to help us uh, run a pilot programme of um, student champions who will be undergraduate students from underrepresented groups in economics going out to schools in their around their universities and delivering sessions on economics and talking about talking to the current curriculum so if it's schools that don't have an economics a level um, on offer going into math classes classes and talking about economics through a math lens or addressing areas of the math curriculum with economics similarly with geography with politics with other relevant subjects um, and we're also talking to careers advisors who obviously speak directly to young people. Um, and as I said, like this perception of economists of all, as all rich white men who do money in banking and banking and run the economy is pervasive, not just in young people, it goes across the board. So we're talking to careers advisors and teachers about what economics actually is and the sort of careers that can get opened up to people if they if they do an economics undergraduate degree. So our next goal is lifting the voices of underrepresented groups. Um, so obviously um, representation in everything that we put out is important, diversity in the panels of our events, we support um, our academic champions and other people doing events to ensure that they're, um, they're, they're, um, they're, they have a diverse range of people speaking at their events. Um, and we also do mini, mini campaigns um, through social media. Um, we're in the, we'll, we'll be doing more of this, I hope, we're in the midst of hiring um, a comms officer to help us with um, all the, the social media and the newsletter and things like that. So hopefully we're going to step our game up a bit with that stuff. But um, we had a Black History Month campaign in October where we had um, young Black economic students and some professors talking about why economics is important to them, why it's relevant to their interests and um, what they're getting out of their degrees and what their hopes are for the future, who their favourite economists are. And um, that's, yeah, you can, you can see the videos from that on, on our website. Similarly, we did one for LGBT History Month where we got um, economists from the LGBT community talking about why they um, why they loved economics, why it was relevant to their lives and, um, and why they thought diversity in economics was important. Um, I just want to tell you this one guy called John Fingleton, who's an incredibly inspiring man, and he had such a beautiful thing to say about diversity that I just want to re repeat it here. A lot of people talk about how um, we need diversity of views, so we were able to represent everybody within society, but he was saying that when you have diversity in a room, it enables you to bring your whole self to that meeting and you no longer need to leave part of yourself outside the door, which I just thought was amazing. I wanted to share that with you. And um, we did a campaign on International Women's Day talking about why um, economics obviously needs women, but why women really need economics and what a rewarding and valuable career it, 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 it opens up to you. And we're also um, doing a podcast. So we had our pilot with Rachel Griffith um, on International Women's Day, but we'll be showcasing loads of different economists from loads of different backgrounds. Um, and hopefully this podcast will be listened to by, by careers advisors and by teachers who can, who, and it can sort of burst these perceptions of economists as all this homogenous group of bankers. So um, lastly, with the trying to get economics, um, A-level economics on the, on the curriculum and in more schools, we're working with OCR, who are an exam board who deliver an A-level in economics, um, and we're going to work with them to train up existing teachers to be able to deliver A-levels in, in economics. Um, and the way that you can support with that is that we, yeah, exactly what Felicia was saying, we need like realistic examples and, and, and things that, um, and, and economists that are inspiring but also examples of economics that are inspiring that it's not just talking to kids about 
I don't know, these dry theories that's talking about real life and how economics applies. So um, professionals that have got interesting jobs, interesting research, um, doing interesting things, making sure that they can speak to the young people um, through that, through, through all these teachers who are going to be teaching A level economics. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it. That'll I've, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and yeah, please do get in touch if you would like to, yeah, support us. That, thanks very much, Maeve. So, so you should say if people do want to get in touch, they should email you. I don't know. So it's maeve.cohen at res.org.uk. Is that, that's right. Brilliant. Yeah. OK, so we have a bit of a challenge. I mean, I, don't, I mean, I'm happy to answer this as well. But um, so the question is, how do we know that getting more people from marginalised groups to study economics is an a priori good outcome for them and not just the economics profession? Might it be better for them to keep prioritising studying what they see as being most relevant to them? Or do we feel we know better what's good for them to study? So I, I don't really feel that that's where Discover Economics is coming from. I mean, we're not telling people what to study. I think we're more focused on removing some barriers and creating some opportunities in a world in which very few people know what economics is or have any opportunity to find out what it is. But um, And I think also there is evidence on you know the types of um, subjects a lot of people study who, that don't study economics like psychology or sociology are sort of less well remunerated so and I think um, partly people are studying those because they lack the information or they lack the awareness and that's really what we're doing we're addressing a very specific market failure so in the language of economics people don't have economics in their choice sets and we're putting it there and they don't have the information to make the choices and we're giving it to them rather than necessarily telling them what they should or should not study. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, sorry. I don't know whether you have. I sort of answered that, but I don't know whether you have anything else to add. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think. I mean, it was sort of interesting because that's also borne out by the re recent UCAS report, which highlighted economics as having specific problems as a subject to choose because it's fixed in terms of many universities requiring specific subjects in order to study economics, not necessarily economics, but maths. And also there's, a, there's, there's low levels of understanding around economics and poor careers advice that people get, particularly in state schools. So a lot of people might realise too late that they lack the necessary qualifications to study it. And they may, you know, particularly if they're only taking it for A level, so they don't really understand what it's like or realise that they enjoy it until it's sort of too late to have chosen the things they needed in order to study it. So I do think there's a sort of information problem, which um, campaigns like Discover are really trying to target. Um, so what we've also, um, I'm also going to just raise this because we've sort of crowdsourced this question about the GS. So I'm just going to put it out there in case the person who um, want, was asked the question is still there. Maybe I can see the question. So there are strict nationality requirements for GS, but quite good blind recruitment to help with diversity. Um, British citizen, EEA, Commonwealth citizen, Swiss national, Turkish national, um, in individuals must have the right to work in UK, don't offer sponsorship for these vacancies. So I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. We, we can I have more questions for the panel or for the audience. Um, do keep your questions coming. Um, and now finally, we're gonna to turn to Steffi, who I think for a year has been the first RES diversity champion. So it's absolutely great that the RES appointed um, a diversity champion and absolutely fantastic that Steffi has the role. So you can tell me about what you're doing um, and what you'd like other academics to do in terms of promoting diversity. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, and thank you, everybody. It has been uh, very useful to hear all what you have to say and also have been changing my slides as, uh, as presentations go because I don't need to say this, I don't need to say this thing anymore. So I, have been, I was appointed actually in September 2020, so less than a year. Uh, it feels a year because that's how, where we are at the moment. But yeah, so in this presentation, I'm going to tell you a bit of uh, what are the plans, perhaps. It's a project for, uh, with the, uh, the Royal Economic Society and some of the things we are doing already, we are doing now. So, of course, I don't have to convince you anymore that... Uh, it matters, like having diversity matters, but perhaps linking it to, to this uh, last question that Sarah was talking about, we need to attract diversity in economics because it's, it's a circular thing, right? If we have more diversity, people from different, different backgrounds, they come from uh, different ideas, different ways to see the world, and therefore they are gonna pose different research questions. We know that economies occupy a very important role in society. 
And therefore, they occupy very important roles in policy making, for instance. So in order to address some of the issues that we have, perhaps some of the issues that Felicia was mentioning, we need more uh, diverse background that they actually can talk their experience and see how we can change policy. And another reason perhaps that, uh, so I'm not gonna talk about economics pipeline because, uh, sorry, that's what uh, Arun talked a lot, but we are going through various crises at the moment, or in, in a way, if economics try to respond to society issues, well, these are the issues that are going through the society. And economies has been heavily criticized for not engaging much with these issues. Uh, we have seen that, and so for instance, uh, here it is, in the last seven years, I think, since uh, the financial crisis, we have seen that every now and then in the news, we have a criticism to economics, uh, whether economics um, is engaging with women or not, whether is, uh, there is discrimination, a gender discrimination, racist, after the Black Lives Matter movement, there was a lot of discussion whether economics actually uh, engage with racism, whether there is racism within the discipline as well, and of course the lack of diversity points towards that. And that has created a response from our students as well. Now we have students that the students are coming into economics demanding answers for this, uh, these questions. And we are saying we provide a, an amazing package of tools to economies to study very interesting aspects in the society. But then therefore we have, they want to see this reflected in the curriculum that we, we teach. And in fact, we have seen that the students are, are asking for that as well. So I think for all these reasons, it's really important that we, we focus on diversity, not less because of course it's also good salary-wise. Being an economist, we know that uh, you get higher salaries. Uh, so as a diversity champion of the Royal Economic Society, I have set up some very short-term strategies. The short-term strategies uh, which is my current program is based on the fact that I want to hear more from people. I want to work more with people that has already been working on these issues for much longer perhaps than I have. And I also want to see what they have done uh, and what, uh, how the Royal Economic uh, Society can support that. Before going there, let me just tell you, and perhaps uh, again, this has been already mentioned, but what what definition of diversity and definition of inclusion I'm using within uh, my programs and within all my activities. Diversity is not, and I, I understand because of how the limitations of the data, sometimes we look at just gender, sometimes we look just at ethnicity, but the, the diversity is very dynamic and multi-dimensional multi concept. And therefore we need to, uh, look at the specific context when we talk about diversity issues. In economics, for instance, there is a lot of uh, lack of diversity, gender, uh, uh, sorry, lack of uh, gender representation. There is uh, some ethnic problems, race, but also there is a social and economic status that that's what perhaps May was talking before. So when we look at diversity within economics, we need to look at a broader definition. But diversity is not going to solve our problems in economics. And I think, again, this has already come up in our discussion today. Because if we attract more diverse people, uh, different backgrounds, we need to provide an environment that allows these people to achieve, to get good degrees to begin with at university, to get to good positions, to get to professors if they stay in academia, to get to uh, whatever, uh, chiefs of economies if they are in the professional world. So we need to create a community that actually empowers everybody. So in order to create an inclusive community, therefore we need to embrace the diversity that we are trying to attract. Without doing this, I think in that case, we're gonna be doing a disservice to the people that we are trying to attract. I'm sorry. Uh, so diversity alone will not drive inclusion. We do need new policies for this. 
So what are the objectives that we have for this academic year? Oh, sorry, for this year. I'm already oh, thinking yeah, I'm sorry, teaching more. No, go, 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 go. I'm so sorry, there has been nothing in the last two hours, but right now there is a, thing, a whole thing going on outside my house. Okay, so one thing is to raise awareness because from the conversations that I have had with a few people since September, I've noticed that, well, of course, perhaps Arun, May, and Felicia, we are all into this discussion and we keep talking about these things. Once we move away, away from this bubble, there are things, people think that the, uh, there is a problem. Some people think it's a problem. Some, think, some people even don't think this is a problem, full stop. And so these are the people that we have to try to integrate into the conversation. Because if we don't do this, it's gonna keep just us talking about these issues. And we, we are not gonna move forward if we keep on this. Uh, so race awareness is gonna be one of the key things in the next couple of years and make diversity and inclusion central to everything that the Royal Economic Society work. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, everything that the Royal Economic Society does. This is kind of some of the key things that uh, we want to do. Improve our data collection and analysis because as the previous, uh, um, especially Arun's, but also Anna's uh, presentation show is that if we don't have data, it's gonna be more difficult to build up evidence to create, uh, to, to do research about these issues. So we are working in improving our data collection analysis um, we are gonna, and we are gonna then eventually create a three-year program on diversity and inclusion. So I guess my main point in this presentation would be like for all the people who are listening, if you do want to, in the same in the same way as May was saying, if you do want to get uh, get engaged, please do contact me. And perhaps we just have a nice conversation over a cup of coffee and a cup of tea, but we can come up together with ideas and how people can collaborate and, and work on this. Uh, as I said, some of the first steps that we are uh, working on already are in improving the data collection and not just qualitative, uh, sorry, quantitative data. We are aiming to also improve qualitative research in, the, in this area because the quantitative data can tell us a lot about diversity, but perhaps tell us a bit less about inclusion. In order to create how people feel within the discipline or what is the culture of the discipline, we need more work on uh, qualitative research. Uh, we are working on this with the Women's uh, Committee and Education Training Committee of the Royal Economic Society. Uh, so the other thing that we are trying to do is set up a proper mentoring uh, program. In this, we are going to be working with other groups, not just within the Royal Economic Society, but for instance, at the moment, we have conversations with the European LGTBQ group in order to set up a broad mentoring program. But we want to provide formal training for mentors and we want to mentor senior roles too. So we don't want the mentorship to go only to, towards people from underrepresented backgrounds because it's like, they are not the problem. We want mentors to go to everybody to understand the problem and so address the issues. So that's uh, something very important. We are going to be working on a diversity strategy for all the Royal Economic Society events, including the Royal Economic Society annual conference, improve our online presence, and just collaborate more. So just to mention some of the collaborations uh, that we have at the moment. So we are already working with the, the Women's Committee and especially the work on data is gonna be done with them. With the Education and Training Committee, we're gonna work a lot on the curriculum, uh, what we teach in economics and what is the culture of our economics degrees. And hopefully soon we will be able to involve more Royal Economic Society members. Uh, we're gonna put all, uh, all together into the website. In addition, uh, we, of course, we are working with Discovery Economics and uh, hopefully we, we get a, a lot of things done, but something in the, with the academics network, we also aim to create a diversity network. So hopefully those two things can work together. Uh, with the Black Economics Network, we have uh, in contact now and we are uh, planning a session on careers in academia for uh, members of the Black Economics Network in the near future, hopefully before uh, the end of this summer. 
with the European Committee for LGBT, we are working on a mentoring scheme and also in improving signaling for the job market, for instance. As I said, I don't have results yet, but I can tell you what we are uh, trying to put. All this is going to fit together in a long term strategy, perhaps towards the end of this year, we can put a three year program together. Uh, but it's going to be fed by all these activities that we have. If you want to know more, there has been either by the Royal Economic Society, so our rooms are progressing somewhere around here, but there are, especially for people, and this is in our aim to create more awareness, some of the things that you can read about, if you feel that you need to know more about these things, there is some uh, literature already there, and some of these are quite engaging and easy to follow. Go back to the pipeline, I do think that the one way or an important way to improve this pipeline is to improve the culture. It's not just me. There are a lot of people working on this and I really hope to eventually get to work with all these people in just making economics a much more inclusive and diverse discipline. But I think that's all what uh, I have to say. Thank you very much. And sorry for my dark noise. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're very very inclusive at the RS, including of pets, clearly. <laughs> Everything. Um, so I think that was really powerful, actually, the, the drawing that um, distinction between diversity and inclusion. I mean, I hope that by making economics more diverse, it'll be more inclusive. But I agree that we need to work hard to make it more inclusive. We have a, I mean, we have a sort of question which um, I think relates to that. Um, so the question says, do we need to think just as much about supporting students from diverse backgrounds once they are studying economics as opposed to simply improving representation on entry? I mean, I think the answer would be yes. So perhaps I'll rephrase the question and say, you know, do you have any ideas as to how to support students from diverse backgrounds? Perhaps first to Steffi and then maybe to Felicia or others to contribute. Yes, uh, uh, actually, yes. In January uh, 2020, we ran a conference. It was a women in economics, so it was uh, very gender based. But a lot of things came out, came out of that conference and how to support the students once they are uh, within the university. Because as I said, it's not important, it's not uh, enough to attract more students but we need to do something when the students are within university because otherwise we can lose them and they feel like they don't belong to this place. And economics can feel a very narrow and uh, insider uh, culture. So there are a few things came out and I think Maeve mentioned one already, we have to move away from these econ economies, just think about money and wearing a black suit and, and you know, uh, but something that is very important is to somehow work on how as universities, as Department of uh -huh. Economics, we help students to feel they belong to, to this discipline, to their university, to the department. So in, in a way, we need to diversify what is the sense of belonging. Sometimes we have that universities adopt a one way, oh, you are from Warwick if you are this student. But no, if we are attracting a diversity of students, we need to consider how we are engaging with that diversity. And this might mean to, uh, might mean to have diversity in the sense of belongings of these students bringing more uh, role models uh, that are diverse, but that they also have different experiences to tell. Because sometimes the role models that we bring are face diverse, but the experiences are very similar to what everybody else have. So we need to have diversity in experiences and, and live. And there were a few other things, and I'll perhaps I'll talk a bit more about in a session tomorrow, but happy to share. We wrote the document as well for, for this, so happy to share the document if people are interested. So I'll let other people reply to this. That, that's right. There is a session tomorrow on diversity in education. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So I think that that would be great for picking up on some of these. Does anyone else want to? I mean, there's a sort of a sort of an, another question on related uh, topic of you know, do, do, does the does the RES or does do the panelists have any ideas about the experience of students at university? And you know, I guess we need to not only worry about the composition of students, but also then track through their experience, their satisfaction, and also their, their degrees that they get and their outcomes. And I think there's clearly a lot of work to do in universities, some of it at university level, but, but perhaps some of it spe specifically at economics level to think about the best ways to support students. Does, it, does anyone want to comment on that? Something I didn't, uh, I kind of touched on, but I didn't show in the kind of numbers is that we have some data on attainment specifically 
and you see that individuals actually from most ethnic minority backgrounds, including the groups that look slightly more overrepresented, still uh, have their attainment gaps. So conditional on all of the background characteristics, so you can observe all the things that you know about them. Uh, they tend to do less well uh, at university. They're less likely to get a 2-1 or less likely to get a first uh, than uh, their white counterparts. And so that it's certainly in the ethnic, ethnic dimension, that's uh, kind of very striking. Um, I think that's, that's clear on the very quant side. It doesn't help us understand directly in itself uh, what are the underlying reasons for that. It's, it is, I think, striking that it's not just uh, the groups who are generally underrepresented, but it's ethnic minority individuals, including those who aren't underrepresented in the first place. Um, so that sort of, uh, it is striking that it's there the whole way through. We are, in some of the work that uh, I've been doing with colleagues at IFS, uh, we're interested in doing some qualitative work as well that we're uh, planning to undertake shortly specifically to do that. And I know various other people on this call may want to touch on that, but that, that are, have been doing uh, uh, work talking to them, certainly at Discover Economics. Uh, we have a set of students that we've been talking to as part of the work that we've been doing, um, courtesy of uh, support from the Bank of England who've linked us up with them. Um, but that's been very helpful for us, again, in understanding uh, what are some of the issues that they face um, when making choices. Because I think there's a lot you can learn from numbers, but there's also a lot that you can only un understand by really asking questions to people who are facing uh, the issues to really get a sense for well, what, what is it, that's, what do we know about it and what they, what's their experience look like? What, how can that help us understand what's going on that we see in the numbers? And those attainment gaps, do you know they're worse in economics and other subjects? or in... They are worse in, in economics and other subjects. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes you want, you know, is this a sort of general Russell Group problem or is it a particular economics? It's quite disappointing to hear that, that it's an economics problem and more to do. We have... Um... Yeah, we don't, I should say, we don't have anything on satisfaction. So the other part of that question someone asked was about satisfaction. I haven't seen any data that have uh, kind of satisfaction scores. So obviously students do say how they feel about university and so on in various... Uh, surveys that we ask them as universities to undertake, but I, I haven't seen any data that we can actually access to let us look at that. That, that. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Does anyone else want to add anything on sort of improving students' experience and, and how to support that? I think it, um, uh, yeah, going off what Stefania was saying before about um, making a more relatable experience and um, diversifying reading lists, for example, to include reading um, material that actually relates to students' experiences so that they feel that they can engage and relate to the examples or the um, material that they're using to work with. Um, that's something that's come up a lot when we um, discuss things in the Black on Myth Network um, discussions. So that's one thing I know students would definitely benefit from, especially from underrepresented backgrounds, as it helps them to better connect the dots of why they may be actually there studying economics as opposed to like long equations and it's like, oh, where is this going kind of thing, but yeah. Great, yeah, so hopefully some of these issues will get picked up in the session tomorrow. I mean, there's obviously been some big changes in how economics is taught with the introduction of the core curriculum, which I think tries to make economics more engaging, more real world relevant and more data driven um, from the start. But obviously, there's a long way to go. Um, so I don't know if, if no one else has any final comments. I think we'll probably end here. And just to say thank you very much to the panel members. I think that was really helpful. And also, you know, hopefully gave you an insight of what's going on and how to get involved and how to work to kind of change things and improve diversity and inclusion. Um, I should flag there's more sessions both on diversity in education and also on uh, gender and economics, I think tomorrow, I think two of them clash, so tomorrow at 3.30 and also Wednesday at 3.30. There's a good range of special sessions covering uh, these and similar issues. And then one final thing to ask is if you could, um, I think there's a, a, a survey of your satisfaction with this session, so if you can <laughs> fill that in, that would be great. And then it'll help the organisers to um, see how the overall conference and the different sessions have gone. Um, yeah, so I don't know whether I can do a virtual clap or a real clap, but um, if I could say thank you very much to all the, um, the panel members and presenters, um, and thank you very much for the work you're doing and uh, discussing these issues today. Thank you.